Hi, everybody. I'm Thomas Miller, the Finthorn Foundation Writer Editor. I'm here in Scotland. As you can see outside my window, it's uh, dark. And these three members of the Lorian Association, David Spengler, Freya Seacrest, and Jeremy Berg, are all in the west coast of the US, so it's much lighter. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks Likewise. To you. Likewise with you. Thanks. Uh, so my first question is about the Lorian concept of sovereignty, and I'll frame it a little, a little bit for people who are watching so they understand what I'm getting at. So I, I occasionally meet people who come to Findhorn visiting and they've heard of channeling. And um, the idea, I think, behind channeling is that an entity kind of like takes me over and then I speak with its voice or something like that. And um, there may be a place for that, maybe not. But in any case, Lorian has taken a very different stance, which is to develop this concept of sovereignty. David, uh, maybe you want to explain what that is. So the idea of sovereignty, it goes back to my initial training with my subtle colleague and mentor, John, who uh, basically um, was very concerned uh, that um, a relationship of in, uh, interdependency developed. He didn't want any uh, you know, power differentials here because he was this um, radiant figure of light and I was not. <laughs> So, um, so he stressed this point that each of us uh, has the, um, the sacredness of our own unique identity and each of us is a generative source of, of light in our own way. And, and you can't um, compare the two in the sense that uh, my light is better than your light. So, uh, so what he was very much wanting to emphasize was the basis of partnership and the idea that what you have are people or, or beings coming together who um, could honor each other difference and yet at the same time be different. And, and, and obviously there can be a lot of difference between a physical person and, and, and a non-physical one. So part of the idea too, uh, out of which sovereignty developed is the, the sanctity of, of the individual's identity. Um, if a person runs into problems in, in working with subtle energies or subtle beings, most of the time, those problems, in my experience, revolve around uh, loss of identity, not always uh, in a a deliberate way, but just sometimes through the, the strength of power or the impact of the energetic differential between one person's consciousness and another's. So I'm standing, what I call standing in our sovereignty, recognizing the unique link that each of us has with our own sacredness is a way of um, keeping that from happening. So I use the term sovereignty, I, other words could be used, but I use the term sovereignty because to me, it suggests the ability to be self-governing. And, and this was really what, what my inner colleagues have gotten at over the years that uh, each of us is a self-governing uh, entity. And it's our responsibility, it's our uh, right to make our own choices and not have those uh, take that uh, ability taken away from us by a being who seems more powerful or more radiant or whatever. Now you mentioned uh, channeling and uh, and yes, you know one of the first things John said to me when he appeared was. Um, and John, John is your non-physical colleague. John is a non-physical uh, being. Uh, who first appeared to me in, in 1965. And he said, I'm, I'm not interested in channeling. And I wasn't either. In fact, I said to him, you know, if, if we want to work together, I'm not interested in being a channel. I had a number of friends who were channels. They were basically came out of a spiritualist and mediumistic uh, tradition. 
but that wasn't of interest to me. And he said, well, it's not of interest to us too either. What we want is a, is a partnership and not uh, one being taken over another. But having said that, there are situations in which channeling is in fact a valid and appropriate uh, relationship. Uh, it's, I think of it as an older one. It is belonging to past ages of human development, but there are situations in which it might be appropriate. So, you know, I'm not passing judgment on it. I'm just saying, as you did, that's not our way of going about it. Sure. Um, one thing you, you alluded to, one thing you mentioned when you were speaking was um, how we're, source, we're generative sources. So uh, for me, trying to sort of um, understand the Lorian point of view, that was, that was one point that took me a really long time to begin to wrap my head around essentially. But I think what you're saying is something like we are not just receiving input from the world, let's say, but actually, as you said, we have a connection with the sacred and we are actually continually sort of pouring out influences. Um, yes, that's, that's essentially it. There's uh, another aspect to it. Um, so uh, imagine if you and a bunch of friends go out to dinner and you discover when it comes time to pay the bill that you have no money with you. And so there's this moment of feeling uh, aghast that and maybe a little ashamed because now you're going to have to depend on the largesse and generosity of your friends. Uh, and, but you, would, you wish that you had something to contribute as well. But in that moment, there's a, an awkward power differential between you and your friend, the ones who have the money and you who don't. Uh, and, and I'm assuming in this story, you know, that you haven't arranged ahead of time that, hey, come on and be our guest, you know. Um, so, so John was very um, careful about these power differentials, these energy differentials, and essentially saying that you can't have a true partnership if one half of that partnership is feeling inf inferior to the other. So, um, so what John did is he, he, he put me through an exercise. It's, it's not an exercise that I could do for somebody else, but essentially what he did was he, he turned off all of my, uh, I guess you'd say psychic sensitivity. I just went uh, uh, blind and deaf to the subtle worlds. But before he did this, he, he, I mean, he told me he was going to do this and he said, I want you to pay attention to any, uh, any light that you feel, anything you feel that you, feel is coming from spirit, pay attention to it, see, see what you're experiencing. So then he shut me down for a week. <laughs> and then at the end of the week, uh, he opened up my inner awareness again. And he said, what did you experience? And I realized that during that time, I was experiencing this kind of deep um, note of energy, like the, like the percussion of drums, you know, in music that holds the beat. Or, uh, and it wasn't an, an energetic source of uh, light. And John said, uh, that's your self light. And he said, it's generated by the act of incarnation itself. It's just inherent in each person. It's somewhat like um, if I go out and I run in the morning or I do any kind of physical exercise, my body gets hot. It puts out heat. So um, incarnation being a, an energetic act, a spiritual act, it puts out the spiritual equivalent of heat. <laughs> so in a sense, he's saying uh, every person on earth is, is like a living star. They're generating spiritual energy. It can be a very dim star or it could be a very bright star, but it's always there. And it's there as a function of our, both our sacredness, but also our, uh, the very act of incarnation itself. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I now have this sense that I'm a generative person, now it's like 
I'm the person in the restaurant and I find I've got money in my wallet. I don't have to feel you've got all the light and I don't have any. I can feel, all right, you might have more light than I do. You're richer, but I can contribute as well because I also am a generative source. Therefore, we can form a, uh, an equal alliance. We're both sharing what we can. So that's the idea behind generativity. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Freya, would you like to say something? Otherwise, I will um, say something. You can go ahead next. I have some thoughts about back um, sovereignty. So go ahead. All right. Um, because let me, put a, let me put a human story to this. Um, because there was a time in my life, well, I had a career in architecture that was somewhat successful. I was on the cover of Popular Science and other things. Then I had a career in um, college administration and teaching. And for a variety of reasons, I found myself, you know, leaving that kind of work, I was divorced. And I found myself on the road doing um, a kind of low social order job, making good money, but, but you know, traveling a lot and being alone a lot and feeling like life had passed me by. Um, feeling like I no longer was really contributing. All of the things that were very meaningful to me had kind of fallen away. I had been studying with David for many years and obviously the, the Finhorn material with Dorothy's McLean and all the other wonderful things that have come out of Finhorn. And so I'm on the road and I really was foundering, wondering, you know, what do I do next? And where's my next career? You know, where's my next uh, contribution to, to the planet? And, you know, and feeling like I'm, I've, I've sort of lost. I came across David's book, The Call, which is a very simple, uh, really a transcription of a talk he gave. And in the, the, the basic um, uh, message of the, of the book, The Call, or the basic theme of it, is that each of us may come to earth with particular work to do, you know, uh, become a doctor, a lawyer, a, you know, a candlestick maker, whatever it is. But in back of that is a kind of radiance or is a kind of fundamental incarnational call. And, and that is to bring a certain blessing or gift of self you know, what I would call sovereignty or the gift of identity flowing out into the world as a living energy that blesses the world by its very nature. And it didn't require um, a particular work to do. What it required is that I stand in my understanding that I was able to do it, that I could bless whomever I came in contact with or whatever environment I came in contact with and do it because that's the nature of what I am as a, as a person. Um, so it really, as a practical matter, really helped me get through this idea that I needed to be doing something. I needed to have some big world project to actually fulfill my soul's mission. And there's a wonderful um, comment that um, David made that said, you cannot not do your soul's mission. Um, it is what you are, like David was saying, he was shut off from all these other things, but part of his, part of the incarnational act is to be, is to, this life energy is flowing into our domain and it's flowing through us and by being aware of it by by can augment it and we can stand in that place of blessing no matter what we're doing no matter who we're with no matter what life circumstances we find ourselves in mm -hmm. and that was very um freeing for me because i no longer i i could i could step into that essential radiance my essential you know, to, to use Dorothy's language, you know, my, my essential God self and experience that as a, as a, a, a source, a generative source for the world that actually made a difference. So that was very, and 
we're studying various other way, you know, ways to basically step into that. But when I do a workshop or when I when I um, am with something, that is the essential thing that I step into is my capacity to be a blessing and so, to love. So Jeremy, let's say uh, you're you're going to get a coffee at the corner coffee store, and you make that decision, that internal decision to actually turn that into a situation of blessing. What is that internal experience for you like? Well, first of all, that, that's a very good thing. So it says <laughs> incarnate on my cup. Okay. And, 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 I, and I do visit the coffee shops from time to time. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's nothing more complex than just smiling at the person that's that's um, taking my order or being being present to them being present to them and not treating them as a tool of of the delivery of my coffee but i can actually do the same thing with my cappuccino machine at home which i really love <laughs> i can i can bless it too i can bless the whole process of uh, the farmers that are growing hopefully the organic beans and the shipping and all of the process that brings it to me but I can also you know as a practical matter you know Thomas I mean when you know if you're bleary-eyed and you haven't had your first cup of coffee it, it, it is admittedly more difficult <laughs> but um, but once you know you've had two or three cups then you can go back to the, <laughs> the clerk and say but you know I, I'm joking but you know I'm, but, yeah. but to try to be present to the moment, try to be present to the person that's there and, you know, give them a nice tip and smile and say, thank you for, you know, being the delivery system for my, um, my cup of coffee. Thomas, some of it just comes down to the simplicity of recognition. Mm -hmm. I recognize you as a fellow being. I, I actually see you in, as a person. And as Jeremy said, not as a weight person or as a role but as an individual, and that's, that's, the blessing flows through that. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, there are mornings where it's coffee first, blessings later. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough, okay. And, Actually, and, and yes, can I just ask one more thing? Can I just ask one more thing? Because I sure, think sure. what you're identifying there, this being present, is actually very, to, to the, uh, the waiter in the coffee shop or whoever, right? Even, even, my, even my, my little water container. I can be present to it in its, you know, in, in its beingness. And that's actually, I think that's good practice for dealing with subtle beings. Is that right? Because that's kind of the same, yes. same the essential attitude that we need to bring to life if we're going to partner with the world. Is that it's, right? It's through that's, partnering. Yeah. It's through partnering that I suppose I've come into some of the broader experiences of generativity or um, sovereignty because I can't be a partner unless I can be myself it, unless I can stand fully in myself and after I, I, I have a very distinct memory of an experience of being in a car driving around a roundabout in some place in San Francisco and at that moment I, I had just come back from Finthorn having lived there for the three years that I did back in the 70s and I was thinking about how do I carry on this work that I had been doing at Findhorn? How do I carry on the kinds of spiritual connections that were there and talked about more openly back there in San Francisco? And I realized that the way for me to keep my connection to subtle realms, which I had started with my own work with the garden, with Dorothy, with nature beings, um, and some of the other things that were opening up on from there, the only way to do that was for me to really be grounded in myself as a person. That's the more I could be present to myself and to the world around me, the more these I could have connection with these subtle realms. And that's been an interesting piece for me that has um, shown up in various ways, being an administrator and working in partnership with people. But the same principles apply in working with partners with subtle realms. They too are beings to be respected, to be met, to be clear in myself so that I can actually show up to be a partner. Um, and so it's been, in a way, a lot of my practice has been how can I be a better person present to the world around me 
And in that, my own subtle connections have continued to develop and open up. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then moving a little bit more into how we can interact subtly with our environment. Uh, another concept I thought we could discuss is energy hygiene. And to me, it's a little, it's pretty fascinating how when we discuss these things, it's actually, it verges on the very like most normal level. How am I feeling, right? That's kind of what we're talking about. Am I present to myself? Am I actually allowing myself to feel my feelings? But then I would also like us to discuss um, how that actually influences things on, on uh, levels that we don't necessarily see or perceive uh, in physical ways, you know, with our five normal senses. So sorry, that was a little bit of a roundabout question, but the question I guess is um, energy hygiene is another Lorian concept. And could maybe you could describe it a bit and uh, give some examples and, and how people watching this might be able to apply that where they are. I'm going to start by saying um, we have one of our teachers uh, in classes. She's not energy hygiene. She calls it energy tending. And I think that's actually a nice development or, or expansion of, of what we're talking about when we're talking about energy hygiene. Because um, it's not just about washing our hands. But it is really a, a practice of awareness. So one first step of energy hygiene is being very present to you, to yourself. You know, knowing, being able to be honest um, in yourself about what might be going on. Um, another principle of energy hygiene, when we talk about it, or energy tending, is working, being aware of flow. Something when it's stopped, um, it's harder to get started. Train when it's stopped. Is harder to get started but when it's even in motion you can keep it going with just a little finger push and attention mm -hmm. so part of energy hygiene is being pay it, putting attention to keeping ourselves in the flow of life and when we could you say more could you explain that just a bit more like what what, sure. what is the experience of that for me the experience actually comes down as it often does to very practical things, as you were saying, if I'm feeling kind of blocked up, say for me being an administrator, often it's meetings and it's like the conversation's going on and on and I'm, um, it doesn't seem to be getting anywhere and it seems like things are blocked up or sort of stopped and the circles, the conversation's going round and round in circles. Well, first I need to be attentive to myself to notice that I'm resisting or I'm upset or perturbed by that. So there's that piece of just my own awareness of my own energy. But then if I think in terms of getting it to move into a flow, I may actually start by moving my feet. So no one's necessarily watching, but I can just move my feet in a rhythm. And bringing myself back into a little bit of physical rhythm actually seems to help open up doors between seeing a way to get out of the circle that we might be going around in our conversation to think of another possibility, or even to be willing to interject and stop the group and say, oh, let's stop and just have a time of quiet together to, to help switch the energy. So there's that element of rhythm and movement and flow where I stop, um, <clears throat> I use my personal attention to connect to what's happening within me and then make a very conscious effort to reconnect with a sense of, of um, flow or, so I'm trying, you're wanting me to go beyond flow. Um, or maybe, maybe. A sense um, of connection, a sense of connection with the, the rest of the world around. Okay. So I, I can stop there and let David and Jer Jeremy add something else, so. Cool. Well, I'm happy to jump in. Um, you know, there's all kinds of techniques to um, clear your energy field. You know, you can imagine yourself in a shower of light and, you know, clearing off the, 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 the accretions of the day, the dint, lint and dust that, you know, comes from just living. Um, and, you know, hopefully you, you have an ally or a partner in the subtle worlds that will capable of taking some of that residue off and 
moving it into good places that, that can be transformed and recycled. Um, there's lots of ways of shielding, imagining ourselves, you know, within a, a shield. But I don't find, I, I, I do that from time to time. But um, the thing that is the primary immune system, I think, of the, of the self is this flow of generativity. So if I can align with my flow of generativity into the world, that has my signature on it. That, I mean, it, it is inherently me. It's inherently my signature. It's flowing from places. So it actually has its own immune system, which is, you know, an, an, what an immune system is in the body is a cognitive domain that says, this is me and this is not me. You know, that needs to go and this needs to stay. So if I can I, I align with this flow within me and out into the world, connecting out into the world is a blessing. It naturally is a, is a mechanism of energy hygiene. And to me, that's a kind of fundamental energy hygiene as opposed to the palliative ones we use to kind of, and, and the, which can be very helpful in the moment when you pick something up and this flow isn't really working very well and you need to say, you know, I need to, I need to clear myself of this. Though there's a lots of techniques to do that. Um, William Bloom has written a book on, you know, on um, that kind of work and lots of other people have. Um, but fundamentally to me, the energy hygiene is an act of identity. Mm -hmm. Act of identity flowing into the world as a blessing. Mm. So maybe I'll give you a scenario. You tell me if this kind of fits. So like I, um, I maybe you know I'm going to work and I just hold in myself a sense of, I mean I live with the cat right now. I love the cat to death. So um, I hold in myself uh, that sense I get when I'm when I'm cuddling with the cat, right? And I'm just allowing that to sort of flow out. And everything I see, maybe I just have a sense of connection with that. And then that's actually subtle work, isn't it? Because that doesn't, that's not just in my head. That's not just an experience that's sticking somehow in the confines of my skull. It's actually kind of flowing out, right? And that's the flow, Freya, that you're describing? Absolutely. I mean, David has an exercise he calls loving touch, which is very similar to that, where you getting, and then going back to what Freya was saying about flow, what you've created is a flow of your identity of love into the world, touching the world, touching the cat, and that can be extended into deeper and far in other places. And on, at that place, you're not terribly vulnerable. Um, you know, I mean, it's not that something couldn't come along and really shift inner you know, energy, but that's a very nice place to give and nice place to be because it is, it's naturally offering its blessing to the world. You know, uh, the, the, the Thomas energy, the signature that is you and, and is flowing from this deep place of love is, is, is now connecting and doing its generative work in the world. Um, that to me is, a, is a, a really wonderful example of, of energy hygiene. And I think it has its ramifications and implications into the subtle world too. You know, it affects the subtle environment that you're, you're part of and um, all the other, you know, I, I remember we have a friend, Lee Irwin, who was a chairman of a committee in, um, in South Carolina in a college in religious studies. And he would start his meeting. He would imagine at the center of the meeting, a grail. And from this grail is flowing this, this love. I mean, he was, he was kind of doing this as a kind of magical work, but he was, he was letting his, flo lo his love flow out and through the grail and the grail itself attracting its own, you know, presence and flowing into everyone in, you know, out and making a connection to everyone in the room. <laughs> As you see by Jeremy's hand motion, I'm, I'm also struck with flow isn't just one way. Flow isn't just from me out into the world and then where do I, where do I get more of it? It's, it, it really is a reciprocity and a, um, a connection so yes. that it goes out and things come back in. What David was talking earlier about generativity, there may be different things that people add in. You know, I may add in peaches and someone else adds bananas and someone else adds grapes and we've got fruit salad. But, <laughs> but, <clears throat> but that is what we're talking about is in this, in co-creativity, 
in partnership. We're talking about fruit salad. We're talking about everyone being able to add a part to make something that's bigger than any, mm. uh, greater than, it's something more than the sum of its just individual parts. And now I'm, I'm very curious about that because um, I've definitely been in meetings and, you know, I've, I've had that experience of I get in tune with myself and then something in the whole atmosphere flows. And what you're saying uh, sort of leads into the next question, which is, let's say, you know, um, a million people do this. Or let's say, let's say a city of people all become aware of their own subtle natures and they're relating with the subtle worlds in a healthy way. They're aware of their, of their interior dimensions and how it sort of flows out and affects things. And they're, they're all aware of that and they're all doing it in a healthy way. What would that look like or what would that change? What are these emergent possibilities or some of them? Well, mentally and emotionally, it would be the difference between walking in a city that, that is filled with smog and walking in a city of bright, clear day and sunlight. I mean, it's, uh, I don't think we quite appreciate the, uh, and I don't mean this in a judgmental way, but the oppressiveness of the subtle environment that we as human beings create by virtue of being relatively ignorant of what we are putting out. I mean, we are, you know, in a, in, in a way where we are uh, psychological chimneys that um, belching um, psychic smoke into the environment. And some situations and some people much more than others. But if, if we were genuinely uh, aware as a culture, even as a, like you say, just a city that, that now um, is aware of the subtle environment and is consciously working with it, uh, all that would be dispersed. Um, there would be other ramifications. Um, for example, uh, it would be very difficult, it would be more difficult to do some of the things we do now because a lot of the buffering would go away. So, um, uh, you know, there are people who are very empathetic and they don't have the normal the kind of buffering, I should say, that most people do. So if they're very sensitive to hurting someone's feelings or they're sensitive to if they do something and it causes someone pain, they feel the pain as well. But, um, but that's actually uh, one way to think about it is to say that if everybody was uh, operating with a full awareness and, a, and attunement to the subtle nature and the, the subtle nature of the world, we would all become um, uh, m magnitudes of empathy. <laughs> we all become much more empathetic than we are. The nice thing is we would probably then learn how to ground that, how to work with it, because um, you know it, it, it's not a matter of tiptoeing around each other and being obsequiously nice so that we don't you know set up tremors. We would learn how to. Um, how to manage those tremors, you know. So if you said something to me that I took offense to, it's my responsibility to, to handle the energy of that offense rather than letting it revert out back to you and you get impacted with it. Um, so yeah, I think for me, the best metaphor is it would be a clear sunny day <laughs> rather than walking around in smog. Um, I wanted to say that it's important to realize how much we're using metaphor here because particularly in English, we don't have really good words to describe this subtle reality. So we use, I use a word like energy, but in fact, it's really not energy. It's, it's uh, energy like um, it's, it's, it's um, the subtle world has its own uh, kind of matter, its own form of substance. And it happens to be a substance that's very responsive to thinking and feeling, to the kind of, of vibrational waves or forces that are emitted by thinking and feeling. So it becomes convenient to talk in terms of mental and emotional energies. Um, 
but uh, but this, to a great degree, that's just metaphor. And um, but it's still a useful metaphor because it describes what happens. So, for example, uh, years ago, I I met a a friend who was in the grips of rage. <laughs> He had just succumbed to rage because of something that had happened in his environment. And, and I remember him walking towards me and it was like, uh, he was like 15 feet away, but I could feel these uh, red spears. I mean, that's actually what they looked like, like a porcupine shooting out its quills. And these quills were were red and angry and and they were hitting my subtle body um, and it was painful you know you, you get that feeling you know like somebody's punched you in the gut this was like being hit with <laughs> you know a couple dozen hot needles it was coming out of this person's anger um, and you know when you when you do energy tending, which is a lovely phrase, Freya, um, you learn how to take that in and just it erases very quickly, you know. But you have to, but you can't personalize it. You can't say you are hurting me because then that begins to set up our habitual patterns of response that, uh, well, I better hurt you back <laughs> or we just take in the hurt and we hold it as being hurt. And that, that holds that energy to us, doesn't allow it to circulate, breaks up the flow as Freya said. We just really need to say, all right, I'm being hurt, I'll let it go and, uh, and, and move toward the situation as clearly as I can. So, you know, there, I suppose it would be like living in a world where everybody is really skilled in martial arts and their chi is really flowing, so you want to be careful because if I touched you the wrong way, I'd knock you over. <laughs> I just have to be aware of, of how to touch, how to speak, how to act in respectful and loving ways. And uh, um, yeah, it would require some practice. Mm. But I think overall, it would be a terrific world to live in. <laughs> you wouldn't have armies, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, because yeah. you couldn't. Um, you shoot somebody and kill them, and you feel the pain of that death. Uh, that's not something that a soldier could put up with for very long. Mm. Mm. Freya, Jeremy, any? Well, I'm... I'm sort of going to play a little bit off of what David said with regard to the language because I don't I can't say what a world would like would look like I don't think that I right now have an imagination when I do enter into those places of um, connectedness and when there is flow back and forth things happen that I did, couldn't necessarily imagine so I'm not quite sure how I can imagine the world except I can speak to certain qualities that I think it would have, or certain words. Um, one of them would be um, relationship or, or the sense of connectedness. I think there would be less isolation. But I also think it's not where everything's all one and it's this big mush. I think that it would also have the quality of being very um, specific and unique. I do believe that that's part of what we as humans are bringing into this world is sovereignty, is, is the element of sovereignty, which is uniqueness, which is honor and respecting of difference. So there's something about that world which is going to be able to respect difference and uh, uniqueness in ways that w our world does not right now. We, we are more frightened of, I think. Um, <clears throat> so those would be I can go into it from the sense of qualities. Those would be qualities that I think that such a world would have between ourselves as people and between the fact that I know there to be multiple realms of consciousness. And so whether or not I can speak to them directly in human words, which I don't usually, I hold 
a very deep sense of respect and honor and knowing that there's more to the world than what I can know in my head. And just that opens up possibilities, which I have seen reverberate in, in my life in, in terms of, yeah, just possibilities. Can you give us one example of I can give you unexpected? one example of that. And that was when I was at Findhorn for, I believe it was the 50th birthday party. I was back and I um, found myself connecting with a woman who was involved in the, hint the purchase of the hinterlands, which is that section of Findhorn with trees and such. And there was some um, concern that there was maybe some um, pollution there that needed to be handled or looked at. And so I found myself, um, I bumped into this woman, we had a conversation and I asked the question, well, had the nature of beings, had any the devas or nature spirits been um, contacted with through the community to ask about this, to invite their help as had been done in the early days? And the answer was no, not that we knew of. And so I asked I drew a couple of, I mean, out of that, I, not just by myself, but this other woman as well, we drew together a few people and had a conversation about that and started sort of an initiative, which has grown into be what we've called, I called fellowship circles or friendship circles between um, nature beings, again, in new ways for ourselves and for them. But what happened was it felt like there was something that got started by my asking that question. And that night was the um, oh, sort of the, the fun night or the big celebration night at the community. And there was a raffle. And I had bought five raffle tickets. I won three times in that raffle. And I was very embarrassed by the third time. <laughs> my, I had three of my tickets called in that whole situation. And it felt like, and this again, I can only say it was a feeling. I have it not corroborated by anything else. But it felt like an act of appreciation of my asking that question. Mm. So that was my sense of a flow or creativity or moving into that flow and trying to follow it and just ask the simple questions that needed to be asked and a sense of um, appreciation both for what the nature side could offer and that the nature side of just being recognized that there might be you know, to try and give it space to speak what it had to say in the matter. Mm. But it, it was appropriate appreciation because she didn't win five times. No, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> only three, only three. Yeah, right. Moderation. You know, I wanted to just to add, um, I mean, we've all had experiences of flow like that, where suddenly everything clicks and just, wow, like the, the world has come together in such a nice way. And for me, an image of that is um, musicals. Because you have these ordinary settings and suddenly somebody burst into song and all at once the whole street is singing in harmony and <laughs> dancing in harmony and everybody knows you know, the choreography and they know exactly the words and it's, it's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> So, yeah, it's, it's kind of the feeling of that, very wonderful. <laughs> you know, just, just building on that, um, I, I understand your question is, you know, what would the world start to look like if you had people standing in this flow, this sovereignty, and were practicing a kind of energy hygiene that um, wasn't projecting, wasn't replicating all of the problems as they hit us as a virus, we tend to replicate that energy, personalize it, replicate it, and send it back out in the world. Somebody's angry at us, or we feel anger, we feel angry, we replicate it and generate it out in the world. So assume for the moment we're in a world that isn't doing that. I and mean, you have people that are, are tending to their, their energy and their, their own um, field of presence. And you have people um, standing in that generative flow of identity, which, for me is a creative flow. It's always a creative flow. So to me, this starts to look more like an art colony, <laughs> but an art colony, which is also starting. So I'm responsive to, you know, it's like a school of Bauhaus or the school of, of other schools of art and, and music. Or, 
So you have all of this art and music and sculpture and dance and things starting to emerge because people's song is starting to be sung into the world and they're, they're clear to listen to other people's song and have collaborative relationships and start to be more collaborative with the songs of the, some of the inner life and the, the subtle life of the planet and the lives of the plants and the animals. And the, so now you start to have an environment that is, it's not just related to humans, but it starts to say, what is an, what are they, an environmentalist who can listen to the song of the, of the great trees or the song of the land, which is very present at Pindhorn or the whatever. I mean, this is what was, was the great experiment and the great, uh, to me, gift of Pindhorn was this beginning of starting to, to listen and to be clear and to sing that song in concert. So now you have a very environmentally oriented, very creative, kind of civilization emerging. And the people within it are, are very fulfilled in that way too, because they're, they're standing in the, their signature energy. They're not, they're not being, um, I think a lot of us have our identities built sort of off the rack. We come in and, you know, we, we encounter this thing and that thing and this thing, and we put them on and we say, this is who I am, this is Jeremy. But in so fact- For instance, like maybe an example of that? Well, I buy, um, which we just did, we, we flew into California and bought this Audi convertible. Now I'm to drive up the coast and come up here and do some, I did some workshops up here. And now I'm the owner of an Audi convertible. I step into the identity of an Audi owner. You know, I, I'm smug. I, um, you know, in the U.S. that's an expensive, more expensive, well, even this is old, older, you know, I mean, but, but this, or, or I, I wear particular clothes, but what, what I'm really talking about is more psychological things. You know, I was an architect for a while. You know, I dress, I wear a certain type of, you know, round John Lennon glasses. I wear, a, you, know, a, a, you know, a tweed jacket. I wear blue jeans, you know. Um, I'm, you know what I mean? You, sure. you take on these identities of, of self. Um, and all of this time for years and years and years, um, I never saw myself as an artist. But when in my 60s, I kind of come into contact with some of these subtle worlds of the she, and I start doing art. Well, part of my signature energy is to be an artist. Um, but in some ways, it's obscured by some of the other necessities of life and, you know, some of the other things. And as, as like, like you, Thomas, I was in the military and I carried that as part of my identity. But what that's what that song is for me is probably not a, it. Those are conditions that have happened and have conditioned the way I am in the world, but they're not, they don't have to be my limitation. I can step beyond through those and I can let this creative self flow. And to, the, to, to, my, to my betterment, certainly, but also I think to the betterment of the world, um, as I said, I don't know if that's a specific enough example, but it's um, how I experienced it, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe just to sum that up, one way I can think of, of describing that is I could, you know, grow up in a certain family with a certain religion, with a certain outlook, and I could say that's me, or I could get, I could actually sort of identify more with deeper aspects of my inner life, and I could say, ah, I have all these things, but that's not who I am. Who I am is more like awareness. And these are things that are exterior in a certain sense because they just sort of... And, and you can still honor the condition in which you live and begin to express, you know, what you're sensing as, as your deeper, um, the flow of your, of, of your life, of what you're called to, you know, what what is really unique about who you are in the world and what you can, what you can bring, the gift that you can bring, the blessing that you can bring. Because it's not a generic gift. It's not the, the gift that I bring is not the gift that Freya brings or David or you, Tom. I mean, there really are um, signature, signature uniquenesses about us 
and I, I you know, it's God expressing herself <laughs> and, and experimenting with herself, you know, and saying, who am I? Um, this is God's surprise. Um, your <laughs> expression in the world. Mm -hmm. I think one of the uh, most challenging of my own learning experiences about honoring myself is to be willing to stand with the things that I think of as too simple. My gift of self um, could be just that I am willing to be in a certain situation, that I'm willing to be uh, loving, that I'm willing to uh, do the dishes, that that's a real gift. I mean, it certainly started for me in many ways at Finhorn, but it was part of my earlier background family. But to work in the kitchen was equally valued as anything else, <clears throat> any of the other tasks in the, in the community. Now, I have found that as a person, I, I can be very susceptible to what society thinks as a valuable occupation or a standout uh, talent. But the fact that I can stand and truly bring, be joyful while I'm washing dishes or uh, turning the compost or changing a nappy, that is actually an, an art <laughs> and a gift that I bring, which is just as valuable. And I, um, that was certainly one of the Finthorn lessons that came to me in my very early 20s when I was there that has continued to percolate and continue to be a point of discovery, a point of surprise, that those very, very simple parts of life really are so foundational to this kind, this level of identity and sovereignty and connectedness and co-creativity and all the words that I will use now. But the heart of it is that uh, very simple being willing to embrace what's right in front of me and to bring that attention and appreciation. I can't always love every job that's put in front of me. I, I can't start there often, but I can start with appreciation or just recognition and, and some honor. That this has its role. And if I start there, then I do step onto that, what we call a spectrum of love, a whole range of love. Mm -hmm. I mean, nice. I think that's pretty key. Good. So any, any, anything anyone would want to say to sort of wrap up or anything that we might have missed that sort of popped into your awareness but you didn't get a chance to say? No, I think we've covered quite a bit of territory here. <laughs> very yeah, good. yeah, we have, yeah. So thank you so much for this. It's a pleasure and I am really looking forward to seeing you all in our 2018 uh, conference here in September at Finhorn. So thank you guys. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. Okay. It's been fun. Thomas.